Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to the show. Today, uh, we have bringing back one of our most popular guests, uh, Nick Juntila. Did I pronounce last his last name correct? Yep, yep. Hi, guys. Awesome. Hey, Nick, great to see you again. That means if I see you here, we're talking about NFTs and art. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, as always, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. And comments are really cool because it was the popularity of the first episode that we had you on, Nick. That is why we brought you back. I actually got people who actually put real money into NFTs after the this episode. So it, it's it's more really it's one of the few episodes we've ever did that has cost people money. I hope um, they're still happy. Yeah. So Randall, what's a good way to reach us? Well, go to our website, chrisandrandall.com. Also, you can check out uh, our Facebook page, Arts Entertainment with Chris and Randall. A uh, good way to leave a, a bitter, critical comment. <laughs> yeah. Please, that's what we love is bitter, critical, sardonic comments. So uh, for those of you who didn't see uh, the, that episode, and please, it's you can go to our website and you can go to wherever our podcast links are or YouTube and you can find it. I think we'll try to put a link to that episode. Randall, are we going to be able to do that, you think? Probably. All right. So just to resume, uh, the last time we spoke, which was about a year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, there had been NFT art that went for that $77 million. All right, Randall? Yeah. So what is it? Beeple sold a work for bazillions of dollars. Yeah, it was, uh, it was like the yeah. third was... highest amount of money ever paid for a living artist. There's a whole it, story behind it. I mean, it's not it's not a normal thing that happens in this universe. So. Right. It, it was insane. And at the time, people really didn't know what an NFT was. They didn't know blockchain. It, it just seemed a lot of craziness. Nick, you did a great job at the time kind of explaining to us less tech savvy listeners what the heck was going on. But for those of us who those of who listeners and watchers out there uh who didn't see that episode nick can you just give us a, a brief explanation of uh how you got involved in this industry and what exactly is that you've done in this industry of the Wait, NFT before blockchain? we get into it before we get into it, i just want to make something clear nick is my uh full disclosure he is my biological brother we grew up together uh we just happen to have different last names it's a long story but uh were otherwise very normal brothers who grew up together. This is true, and it, and, it, and there is no this this episode was not sponsored or produced by either of your parents, <laughs> uh, nor do either of your parents receive any remuneration for having been responsible for two thirds of the talking heads in this episode. But I do thank them both for doing such a good job of raising such bright and articulate people who are very easy to work with. That said, let's get back to it. Nick, how'd you end up working? in the NFT blockchain world? So I am a software developer and I was trying to build a product that allowed people to keep track of inventory better. And so um, I was doing that as it's sort of a, a third party uh, intermediary company that would come in and, and keep track of data between uh, between uh, different parts of the supply chain. So if you are a manufacturer, you send a product to a um, to a wholesaler and the wholesaler sends to a retailer and the reseller sends to the customer. And each step of the way, somebody has to enter in that uh, data into a database. So the data gets lost each step. And I uh, thought there would be room for a company to come in and um, sort of warehouse that data. And um, I was doing building that and on the way, I realized that maybe this would be, you know, I was also working with blockchain uh, technology because I got pulled in through an old um, friend uh, who was really into a project called Skycoin. He, he, well, he was the creator of a project called Skycoin. And he got me into um, working on blockchain stuff and kind of dragged me in, kicking and screaming. But then I realized that this was a good uh, technology that could be good for a, a wide variety of applications. So um, in about 2016, I started trying to figure out how to put my application that I was building onto um, a blockchain. And at the time, there wasn't really a good option. 
Uh, but then Ethereum came out, and I was, and I thought, well, this is a great. Uh, this this looks like it has a lot of potential for me to put all. So of this I, on. I just want to stop you real quick. Yeah. Two terms, just for the people who are like not as tech savvy as you, blockchain and Ethereum. You just want to give us the the shortest, simplest explanation of what blockchain and Ethereum is. A blockchain is basically a uh, a a set of data that cannot change over time because as you add new data to this chain um if you just think of it like a bunch of um a bunch of stacked up uh text files or something but at the beginning of each text file you have a, a summary of all the text files that happened before it so if you were to try and remove one text file from the mi middle of that stack um and replace it with something else nothing would it wouldn't fit the summary wouldn't fit anymore so you could tell um, that you changed this chain of files because every new one that you add bring, has a summary of the entire rest of the chain that went before it. So that's a blockchain. It's basically a, a system of data that's designed to make sure that you can't tamper with the um, history of uh, the chain of data. Um, and in the case of uh, how we use blockchains today, it's mostly a public version of that. So everybody's adding to this chain and it sort of lives in the cloud and it's like a bracelet right where each person puts a little charm on it would that be a good analogy that's exactly what it is it's like a really long charm bracelet awesome and what is ethereum again so ethereum is one of these blockchains um bitcoin is another one of the blockchains and i'm sure everybody's heard of bitcoin by now or yes. most people and um with bitcoin what most of the data that people save on it um it is mostly financial. It's mostly um, sending, uh, it's keeping track of one number, basically how, how much Bitcoin a certain address has. Anybody can create like a Bitcoin address. And then when someone sends you Bitcoin, um, now the, on the blockchain, it says the guy who made that address now has four Bitcoin or something. And, and that's, you know, that's real money. Yeah, Bitcoin is a lot of money now. Bitcoin's uh, like, well, at the moment it's thirty thousand dollars, but it's been up close to sixty thousand. And Ethereum is like Bitcoin; it, it's it's money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if somebody wants to give you Bitcoin, don't turn them down. <laughs> Accept it. <laughs> All right, that's that is that well, is so, really cool. So, Nick, just to recap, so uh, you were one of the early. Uh, you were working on cryptography, crypt, cryptocurrencies, a long time ago before everybody heard of it. And uh, when Ethereum came along, uh, Ethereum introduced the technology of non-fungible tokens, NFTs, correct? Yeah, even more broadly than that, Ethereum allowed you to save free-form data on its blockchain. So whereas Bitcoin, you can just say, okay, Tom's got three Bitcoin and Susan has one Bitcoin, and now Tom sends one to Susan, so Susan has one more Bitcoin. Um, instead of that, now you can say, well, um, Tom also is going to write um, a sentence and he's going to put that in the chain or he's going to write um, a piece of software and put and save that on the chain. And so now with Ethereum, you can save, you know, basically anything you want, data terms, text, numbers, and then um, and then uh, use that in, in software that you also run on the blockchain. So it's really flexible. So how would you define an NFT? So an NFT is a subset of that idea that I just told you. So uh, if you were to, so, so an NFT is a, a specific uh, format of data that people are saving onto the Ethereum blockchain. And that is like, it's got a name, it's got a description and it's got an owner. And okay. so, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so when you started working with NFTs and you're one of the early architects of NFTs, correct? We covered this in the last episode. Uh, you helped to, to, to develop the format, correct? Yeah, so I was developing a format called Receipt, the Receipt format. I called it the Rec10, um, and it was very similar to what ended up becoming the official NFT standard. Um, but at the time, there was a lot of people working on uh, NFT type standards, um, and the one that sort of won out was the ERC721. And I was also in that discussion group talking about how that would. Okay, and so when you first started working on this technology, you already mentioned it. You thought it would be used a lot for inventory tracking for business. That's what that's what I wanted to use it for, and that was like one of the um, proposed ideas that uh, people had said that Ethereum could be used for is inventory. 
So how is that how is that aspect of your business, that business shaken out? So it's still super early on that. And that's um, an issue and the main issue is because blockchains are still sort of expensive. They come down a lot and um, they were really with Ethereum, it was super slow. So if you've got a warehouse with like hundreds of thousands of items, um, you need to have hundreds of thousands of, for instance, NFTs, blockchain records. And then every time they move, you need to change and transport them and, and update that data on the blockchain. So um, there's so much more happening that uh, something like Ethereum class, the regular Ethereum is just, you know, way too slow to handle. But now we've got blockchains like Polygon um, and Avalanche that are, are way faster. You can have more transactions. So that part of that idea that I had is still brewing. I've taken a step back and started creating more tools for general purpose for people to use. Right, for because Excellent. while you so, were, well, let me on. ask, let me ask. So while you were working on this inventory aspect of NFTs, you're working on NFTs in general, the NFT art market blew up, right? And so right. now so you've, before we get now into you've it, gotten I into it. Just want to ask Nick to just define, because he did such a good job with NFTs. Nick, what is NFT art? Just, I know that seems a yeah. silly question to ask, but. Just again for the unenlightened, what? Because I, I get it from a business computer perspective, but what do we mean when we say NFT art? So, um, so the whole idea, of, uh, you know, this is funny because today, right now, whenever people say NFTs, they think art. But the general public thinks art, which is kind of silly um, to everybody who's been in, in the NFT world since the beginning, because we no one who is in NFTs this beginning thought that people would use NFTs for art. It, it, it just, it's just a strange um, concept because uh, the NFT itself was meant to be sort of a placeholder for, um, for owning something outside the blockchain. Um, essentially, like the first, the first really good use case was a video game item. So people would save a, um, a record on the blockchain and that record would be used in a video game and people could trade those items and then a game would be created in the items you'd use the items in the video game so the idea of, of making an nft and then people trading it just for the sake of the picture that's associated with it is um was was it, it's you know it was uh, not what most of the people at the time predicted would happen um it's more like um a test of the nft technology than than a practical use of nfts because it does prove that NFTs uh, work because you can make an NFT, somebody can buy it from you, and nobody else can take it from you. So it proves that the NFT technology works. Um, but other than that, it doesn't have like a lot of useful value. People have now attached a lot of useful value to it because they say that um, you know owning this NFT is like owning a piece of the artist. It's like, uh, it's like owning, um, it's like being part of a special club who's collecting this art. It's um, donating uh, basically like to the cause of this artist, like to the creation of good art. It's like saying it's supporting the art that you like. So that that part of it. So you kind of have to follow the money because people are not that stupid. You know, people are they have reasons. So, you know, you have like one side, one group of people in the world who are saying, um, you know, why are you spending your money on this? You know, and the other group is like, well, we know exactly why we're spending our money on it. Um, you, you know, we're not, so you have a very sophisticated group of buyers who understand why they're spending the money. And if, you know, and me as a technology creator, if I didn't originally understand why they're spending the money, that's my fault. It's not their fault because okay, they, so money. as Randall had said, before I cut him off, uh, okay. how did you get involved in NFT art? What, what brought you to this place? So I ended up finally, right. So I created an app called receipt chain. Um, to handle um, basically inventory NFTs on um, inventory NFTs uh, for people, because originally I wanted to, to to sell this technology to corporations, but the corporations were you know it's way too early for corporations to get involved with it. So I just decided to take it to the people and say, look, if you want to make an NFT for like your guitar that's sitting in your closet, go ahead, and then you can use that for your personal inventory. And you know maybe people will find some use in this, and then maybe companies will find use in it eventually. Um, and then also in that same app, it would allow it allowed you to sell the guitar, and then somebody could buy it, and then you would transfer that guitar record to the next person. So I thought that might be a useful thing for people. Um, it, oops, sorry, it didn't necessarily use like a blockchain, 
um, or didn't necessarily need a blockchain um, to, to have that use case uh, because uh, because you could get away with not having a blockchain and you and do that. But the blockchain element was so so you could sort of notarize um, like where what the history of something was without it being without you being without it being um, able to anybody being able to tamper with it. Um, so it was like it was always bringing this like really sophisticated element to something that didn't really need it yet, and um, and you now thought, you thought of it as like a proof of ownership. Yeah, proof of ownership. But the thing is, like um, you know, when you make the record yourself, it's kind of a really, it's really not a very good proof of ownership, a proof of like history of who made it, because um, you weren't the origin of that guitar. So if you create, um, so there's very limited use there. Like really, you need to have the manufacturers create these records in order for you to have like any kind of like op real authenticity behind these things. So my, what I created was more like a demo of what was possible, um, but you know, it, the practical value is very limited. But you so made now, a fully okay. functional, uh, you made a fully functional app where people could mint their own NFTs. Yeah. And uh your website will allow people to mint their nfts on your website right now correct sure so i made this app and um i expected people to use it for stuff because of what i told them that it was for and that's <laughs> not, and that's what that's what nobody did so immediately <laughs> like the only thing people started making nfts out of was like pictures of their cats of like um uh, uh f photos of like uh, uh certificates documentation and art, you know, is nothing. And how did that work out? Like, first off, just if people want to use that service, I'm assuming you're still offering it. We killed the app. Apple, Apple killed. Apple made it impossible for for us to continue working on the app. Oh, sorry, man. So no, it's fine. What are you up to now? For Apple, they can, they can. What, what you're off. doing? Something pretty interesting now with artists, right? Um, so well, we yeah, could, you we could go to your website and do the same thing, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, you can go to the website and do it. But the thing is, uh, the thing is, it's it, well, we can get into that in, into that later. Okay, uh, we'll definitely get into it before to the end of show. So, if you want to know more about that, you have to stick through the end of this or fast forward. But we are going well, to do it. The website well, well, is ownerfi dot com. Yeah. The the thing is that the 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 why people are making NFTs and what you can do with NFTs is evolving so fast. Like I want to clarify, like like what's the best thing to make an NFT out of? Like like what what should you make an NFT? I mean, those are really important questions. It's like um, I don't want to set people up for failure. You know, like I want people to do what's. I don't want to waste anyone's time. So Nicholas, um, I just want to make sure I'm really clear. So you were working with this, but then Apple took the uh, app off. It took you guys out of business. Is that right? So um, Apple has very strict policy on blockchain and cryptocurrency products, and if they can't get thirty percent um, fee on top of everything that happens, then they won't allow it in the store. So because blockchain transactions subvert um, Apple Pay and Apple payment system, they wouldn't even let people in our app. Not only they wouldn't let them mint because we they needed Ethereum to mint. Um, they wouldn't let people transfer NFTs because you need to pay some Ethereum, some cryptocurrency or transfer an NFT. So they, they essentially um, took all the teeth out of the app and made it like useless. Oh, no. So it was so difficult to like push updates to the app store uh, because a Apple, I mean, even the, the, the people who reviewed the apps had no idea what my app did. They were so confused because oh, no. they didn't know what NFTs were. One person thought we were selling Easter greeting cards. <laughs> uh, and they said, look, you cannot sell greeting cards in the app store. And I said, what are you talking about? It was so frustrating. And, you know, I had these like calls with people with app, Apple representatives who were so incredibly frustratingly clueless um, about what my app was doing and how benign my app was. My app was so benign and helpful to people who really wanted to make these NFTs. Um, but Apple, uh, Apple's policy was just... Uh, was just it was just like the iron fist and the, the pro and the, what's so hypocritical about that is for some apps they allowed them to continue operating and doing some of the things that we did but it was just the way you worded it and the way that your legal team was able to so they're very hypocritical very um they're very anti-business anyway i could go on about that but we ended up having to just 
rather than just get really tons of bad reviews and have to deal with all this the problems that Apple created for us not being able to um, expand those features in the in the app store in the app store um, it was easier just to say let's just move everything to the web uh, because on the web we don't have daddy Apple you know stopping us from giving our customers what they want all right so then how did you transition to where you are now take us to this to the present day yeah, so basically, you know, I saw that people wanted to do ARP and they wanted to use NFTs for other things um, that had nothing to do with like, you know, um, you know tracking property. So um, so I decided to like make make it easier for people to do that or anything they wanted to do with NFTs. So, um, you know, we just added like sort of general purpose NFT capabilities for people to like add attributes and different kinds of media to their NFTs. And, um, and as that evolved and more people were making nfts um, and we made that process easier for people we, we gave people the ability to make their own collections and smart contracts which made it easier for them to get royalties um, for their artwork and their collections um, as that evolved more and more people started coming to us uh, with this idea that they wanted to do collections you know these large collections so around um, the beginning of 2021 that is when uh, the board ap yacht club uh, came out and the board ap yacht club was sort of the jet there, there was an earlier uh uh there was an earlier collection called um crypto punks which was uh the, like probably the first collection that uh, sort of spurred on this idea of like a collection of like a basically like a, a thousand ten thousand you know large collection nft um set that allowed people to trade nfts as a group kind of like a um a um, like like a token set like almost like an ICO like you like a, a, a specific and a large NFT collection provides like a, a group liquidity to a token collection and that is really important if people want to attach real value to uh, to tokens it's so I don't really want to call it like an ICO because it's not initial initial coin offering offering has like a negative sort of like, cause it's attached to like, oh, well, what are you offering this for? But it's like, in the case of like CryptoPunks, it's not even like, it's not even offering anything other than the CryptoPunk itself. It's like a piece of history. Hey Nick, uh, so would you equate these, uh, the Board at Yacht, Yacht Club and uh, CryptoPunks to, and the Jay Pierce collection that you worked on to like, say like a trading card collection in the real world? Is it, would you say they have similar properties? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot more like that. So it's like Wait, who who is Justin Pierce? I'm sorry, you just you call out that name, and I I don't know who it is. So we yeah we help we started helping people create collections, you know, like um, art collections, um, because this is is where NFT the NFT uh, world is headed. So we decided like we have to work on what is relevant. We can't just keep trying to sell people something they don't I, they're not ready for. I just want to be clear though that. Uh... Board Eight Yacht, Yacht Club and CryptoPunks, you had nothing to do with those collections. Absolutely not. No. But they, they go let ahead. me finish, Chris. But they came out and they were very successful. And they were forerunners. They helped to define uh, NFT art. They were innovators in defining how people were going to use NFTs for the next several years when they started. Okay. And uh, so then, um, how did you get involved with the artist Justin Pierce? So, um, yeah, so I met Justin's uh, a agent, actually a good friend of Justin's, who's also, his name is Justin Pierce. Uh, but um, well, they both have the same name? Both have the exact same name. <laughs> uh, but uh, oh, No relation. Uh, no relation, that's great. No, absolutely, I, no relation. Uh, I think right. that um, the older Justin Pierce, the one that I met, I think that he might have Googled his own name. Um, I have to get con to, to find the artist Justin Pierce. <laughs> And that's how he originally found him many years before I met him. Um, but um, so like, just to, real quick to touch on, so the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, CryptoPunks, they established this idea of, um, of an art collection as, uh, as a group. Um, and then that is what changed, really changed the face of how people saw NFTs and how people are using NFTs. Um, because now they established this idea of a community and um, and market value uh, of a collection, so, and 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 also the network effect of a collection. So, uh, if you have one NFT like a Beeple, 
only one person can own it. You know, that's that doesn't establish uh, ne- that doesn't establish a network connection or vi- virility. You know, that's you, you know that there's the only the community. It's a community of one. So you met Justin Pierce's agent, and he found out you worked with NFTs, and he told you that his client, also Justin Pierce, wants to make an NFT collection. So yeah, so um, if originally uh, this was last year around September. And he was telling me uh, much how a lot of your audience might be thinking like, maybe I'm an artist, maybe I want to make an NFT and I want to sell my NFT collection. And he was saying, well, let's, I have this really great artist who I've been following for a long time. He's, he has the same, same name as me. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, oh, I met, I met him um, playing poker because I really love poker. So I was at a poker event and uh, Justin Pierce uh, uh, starts, starts talking. Actually, I think it was his son, Brett. Uh, I talked to uh, Brett and Justin and um, they told me about this artist. And at the time, people were telling me about a lot of artists. So you know, I didn't think much of it because there's just so, m- so many people wanting to get into the NFTs. Are space. you saying artists, you were being deluged by artists who wanted you to make NFTs with them? Artists, you know, a lot of artists out there are trying to find a way to support themselves because it's difficult to support yourself as an artist, especially um, not a well-known artist. You so, know? so Justin Pierce, his manager, Justin Pierce, they uh, this wasn't the first artist that was trying to work with you. For the sake of clarity, why don't we just refer to Justin Pierce, the agent, Justin Pierce, the artist. So yeah. that way it'll be easier. Well, follow. this wasn't the first artist that wanted to work with you. Uh, no, no. So, I mean, because of the app, so the app, um, you know, it went from getting like one download a month to a uh, hundred thousand downloads in like one month and then 120,000 downloads in, uh, April of 2021. Um, well, which t- I, yeah. Well, I just want, I'm just curious, why did you decide to work with uh, artist Pierce? So, um, you know, well, I really liked his art, you know, he, 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 something about the art really like spoke to me that this is, you know, I was looking at all the other NFT artwork that was out there and I was saying like, okay, like what, it, what is, like, what is this NFT community like in, in, in terms of art? And it's not the hold, same. Hold, hold that thought one second, Nick. Uh, just hold that thought. Randall, I think we actually have his artwork. Can we put that up on the screen? Sure. Let's, and for those uh... of you who are just listening to podcasts, there'll be a link at the website to see these slides, right? Uh, well, I'll, okay. So that way people who are just listening and I'll try to describe what we're looking at as best as I can. So let's, let's actually see Justin Pierce, the artist's work. I think that'll be a lot easier for us to then see what you saw. Uh, so that's coming up right now. Uh, here it comes. Okay. Can you see it? Oh, that's so cool. So this I mean, is so there were four thousand pieces in this collection, correct, Nick? Well, if you want to like see what I was looking at, then you right. should go to his website. Um, and but right now, see. this piece. Look, Chris here just that... wants to look at the work. I, it's a little bit premature because Nick hasn't gotten to how we got to this point yet. But we'll look at it. We'll look um, at it just to see, so it becomes less abstract. So those of you who are just listening, I just wanted it. It it's like a cartoon, I would say, of a man very colorful man who's kind of winking his left eye with a peace sign with a very colorful baseball hat with a diamond in the middle. Uh, it's very cool and very much like almost, it reminds me of like Keith Haring or Kenny Scharf. It's, it's this very, there's something about it that is very light. Uh, yeah. So there are, the, the, uh, we're going to show 10 pieces. Uh, these are, um, these are the top 10 selling in the collection. Well, you don't to have to go through the top 10 just yet. I just want so that we have a visual. So Nick, uh, I'm assuming this is very representative of Justin's work. Yeah, this is this one with the diamond hat and the colorful shirt is uh, probably one of the most rare. Uh, of this the is the number 10 selling and I have in reverse chronological order. Yeah. But it's representative of, so when you looked at this work, uh, and I certainly love it. I, I would love to own this if I had the money. Uh, what is it about this that, can you at least give us a sense to the uneducated, why does this stand out more than the other works by other artists you've seen? So a lot of the other art that was going on was uh, really cookie cutter art that was created like in on Fiverr 
um, just satisfy a need to make collections as fast as possible. So like, like this one that you're showing to is all pixelated. Actually, the, 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 the real version of this is way higher de definition just in case. This is the best we could do with Zoom. <laughs> okay. Well, so, um, so a lot of the art that's created um, in like Southeast Asia and on Fiverr um, was created just to basically fill out like a 10,000 piece collection, um, you know, there of like, you know, super cool fish or, or happy cats or a lot of just, um, uh, they wanted to figure out what's the fastest way they could make 10,000 pieces of art. And so uh, they didn't actually find artists who were known for their work. They weren't known artists at all. In fact, like the artists that they were originally using for like CryptoPunks and Board Ape Yacht Club are not known artists at all. You know, they, they have no careers previously. Um, you know, the, the Board Ape Yacht Club artist now has a career, <laughs> right? Um, but like, you know, so they weren't, they were starting with the idea that they wanted to make 10,000 tokens and then moving from there. We started with the idea that we wanted to sell, we wanted to use, find like an artist who is, uh, who is uh, already like has a career and, and is on a trajectory to be a known artist in the world um, and then go to see what, well, how can we sell his art? How can we popularize his art and use that him as a platform rather than the other way around? You know, Are there any uh, challenges that you faced working because he was new to the NFT scene or in general? There any, I mean, not, not a criticism of them, I'm just imagining when he first started making art, he probably didn't know about net NFT art. Yeah, so like what happened was he wanted to do and if he wanted to make an NFT, his agent, Justin Pierce, um, wanted to make an NFT uh, or, or start with NFTs. And we did not initially just jump to a collection. We didn't say outright or from the beginning that we wanted to do like, you know, a few thousand. We wanted, so we actually started you know, despite Board Ape Yacht happening and some other collections going on, um, we actually started with, let's just, let's do like a one piece um, piece of art and like, you know, like a people style one piece of art and see how that goes. So we did, we started with like an animated GIF that was a special custom piece of art that he did for the web. And, um, and then we, and we tried to sell that and we put it on auction, we still have it. Um, and now actually some people have shown interest in it because now he's, Justin is more known in the NFT world. So the first piece didn't even sell. No, it didn't sell. And, and wow. it didn't sell because nobody knew who he was, number one, because the NFT art world is, is completely separate from the physical art world. I mean, they're, 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 they're completely different body groups of people. And you have to understand that, like, and they don't translate to each other at all. Or like, they are the two may meet. So like, they're just, um, so then how did you get people to know who he was how did you get the buzz as they say so we didn't um we, we 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 decided to do a collection because we were going to do a collection anyway we just we were we were doing a collection with with uh, 3d artists that we knew and the 3d artists uh we were going to create like a few thousand piece collection with this 3d artist and we actually did experiment with some 3d art um, we made these chickadees which are these 3d um uh like like birds um and they 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 sold people really people there was a certain group of people who liked them and we'll probably keep selling them because they're interesting and fun to sell but um you know the the artist was not like a fine artist um like or like a, an artist who um makes a living making art so it kind of crossed my mind at some point like well what if we cross these two things you know and i think up until this point um it was very rare for these two things to cross. But, and the reason being, because it's difficult to make, you can't ask an artist to make, we, we ended up going 4,000 pieces. You can't ask an artist, can you just paint 4,000 pieces of art real quick for us <laughs> to like make a collection out of? No, you have to you have to use a computer and you have to figure out certain elements, enough elements that you can create enough art to fill out 4,000 or 10,000 pieces. <laughs> And it's not trivial at all. So, um, so I, I we proposed the idea to Justin, and and I said it's going to be a lot of work. We're going to need hundreds of like little pieces of, of characters of 
hands and arms and, and, and faces and eyes and stuff like that. And this is in the past, this is like what they, those other guys were getting from Fiverr, but they were getting these artists who, you know, are working for $3 an hour. So they don't care. They're just going to, they're going to work in their sweatshop and they're going to make, you know, uh, 10,000, you know, fancy cat um, eyes and, and faces and stuff. But so to ask somebody who makes a living doing art and sells their paintings for a thousand dollars a piece to, to, to make hundreds of these things is a much bigger ask. So and that's what he was, right? Just to be he clear, was, he was an artist in the physical world. He was an artist originally. in the physical world who was already selling art to people like uh, LeBron James and, um, and Samuel Jackson. And he had customers, he had famous customers, he had charities, famous charities who were his customers, he was doing murals. He, he was he was all, he was on the news you know he was on a Jimmy Kimmel show like not on the Jimmy his art was on the Jimmy Kimmel show. So, so Nick, you envisioned how the artist could put this collection together, right? What it would take, right? So, and and you told him to make certain pieces. So I proposed the idea, and he said he and I didn't know if you were going to be on board with it, but. He said yes, and I told him exactly what he would need to do, and he was 100% on board with it. I was shocked, like there was just it was smooth. <laughs> what did you tell him he needed to do? To make- um, To make this collection. To make like 100 traits or more, 100 like individual pieces of artwork that we would have to scan into the computer and resize and then-, and then Wow, that is, I mean, as- Yeah. That's a big ask for an artist. That is, I right. mean, just for people who don't understand, my mom's a painter. I've grown up around that. It can take a long time to do one piece. This is a guy who probably does in his own life, what, 20, 30 pieces in a year, if that. I mean, it's, it's well, just no, a he, lot. He makes so a you're lot saying, I'd like you to work four times harder. Well, yeah, I mean, so. does he normally make in a year just a physical? Yeah, I mean, he, he's prolific, though. Justin is is not like a thirty piece. Okay. He's a guy who wakes up, does art all day long, and then goes to sleep and then does it again. Like okay, he, Nick. Oh, so he's prodigious. Okay. So Nick, so this collection is four thousand pieces. Each piece is basically like a a, a portrait of a cartoon character. And four thousand pieces. And each character is made up of uh, various attributes, right? Arms, <laughs> hats, eyes, mouth. Shirts. Yeah. Do you, do you have any? Wait. I'm sorry. I gotta. I gotta cut you guys both. Did you say that you had to make four thousand pieces? The collection has four thousand. Yeah, um, Chris. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me go. Keep going because uh, I'm gonna go through with Nick how this collection was made. Okay. And at the okay. end, you can ask questions. Because that's so, insane. Right. So. So Nick, because Nick's already told me this. So. So I'm correct so far, right, Nick? So you had Justin Pierce make these different attributes, right? Yeah. He would draw them on paper. So like he would draw arms, he would draw bodies, he would draw eyes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. He and, he does it all, all by hand on paper. So, so how large were the originals? Um like um kind of like a uh, notebook paper size. Okay. And he used pen and paper probably, right? Um he no, he uses uh like paint and like these like hand uh like marker kinds of things. Okay, Mark, they use marker. Okay, so did you tell me also he had another uh, an assistant color them? Um he, well, he he colors them too. Okay, so he did the coloring as well. Yeah. And then all the parts were scanned in individually, right? Mm -hmm. Disconnected yeah. from any characters, correct? Right. And right. then you wrote a you wrote a program to uh randomly assign parts and put parts together to make 4,000 different characters. Right, well, you're missing another step. Um, well, what was the next step? So then my partner, uh, who's the other co-founder of my company, has to resize everything to get it into, so that all the proportions are correct and relative to each other. Okay, so that was done in the computer, right? They're all scanned in digitally. They're all scanned with a flatbed scanner. Yeah. And then- And they were they, also converted, then they're also vectorized. So she also turned them into vectors. After. Oh, wow. What's okay, a vector? So, I'm sorry. What's a vector? Oh, vectors are, um, so reg regular like raster art is where every pixel is a different color. And um, a, a vector is, are actually when you have shapes instead of pixels. Ah. So uh, what 
when you when you create something and when you vectorize something, uh, you you actually make it so it's like infinitely scalable. You can make it in a higher resolution because you turn it into shapes, and the shapes um, can be scaled up, and they still have um, defined uh, sharp. Edges. Well, you used right. You used vectors because that way you have much more sharper lines. Is that correct? And the colors are much much uh, more accurate. Yeah, yeah, and we get a higher resolution. Okay, and then uh, so they were scanned, they were turned into vectors. Do you know how long that process took of uh, of after Pierce made all the parts and they were scanned in, vectorized, resized? Do you know how long that took? Um, you know, we spent we spent a couple weeks on it. Um, you know, M Masha spent probably a couple weeks on that. So you're talking about the artist, yourself, and Masha. That's a team of three people. A couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, no. Well, Justin actually spent more than a couple of weeks on making the parts, probably a month. How long do you think he took? A month. You know, it wasn't all at once, though. He worked on it. Um, you know, it kind of trickled in as he worked on the different. Okay, things. so now the parts are all in the computer. They're all ready to go. They're all proper size. They're vectorized, and you wrote a you wrote a program to assemble the pieces into the characters, correct? Yeah. yeah. So tell me about the program you wrote. So um, the way that these collections usually work is that there are certain parts are more rare than other parts. So I create a program that would go through and individually create a character. And each time it, it did that, it would choose a trait. It basically started with the background image, like say this, the one that you're looking at is blue. And then it would put on, it would choose a body from a group of bodies. And then, and then it would do a random number generation. And if the random number generation was certain between a certain um, a certain uh, percentage, like between 90 and 100, then that would be rare, it, it, depending on how many traits there were. So the intervals would change depending on how many traits there are. Um, so you get an equal distribution of like rare and not rare. Um, the rare ones would have to be more uh, more. You they have to be selected less often. Um, but if you have more rare traits then you have to um, you have to sort of like expand that a little bit so that uh, so uh, just to interrupt you for a sec the the face and the illustration we're looking at here those choices even though it was created by an artist the assemblage was done by a computer program right so the, the computer wow. the computer so we don't know what you're gonna so we didn't know what the, the characters would look like and that's kind of what the interesting thing is he made like 120 or something um, different possible traits, bodies, eyes, mouths, hats, hair, and then arms. And then, um, and then once the computer went through and generated all these characters based on their specific weights of these traits, then we ended up with, um, you know, we could just run it forever, but we, we ran it like to make like 5,000. We made, we stuck with 4,000, but we made like 5,000. Then we threw out ones that didn't look right. And then we had to make some adjustments and then we'd run it again and run it again. So um, the final collection that, and sometimes we had to fix a couple things that were like slightly off. So we would um, like generate it. And then, um, then I have to like make an adjustment on one of the hats or something like that and then run it. So, um, so the computer uh, really like ended up creating the final characters. And uh, and then we we were pleasantly surprised by some of them because we hadn't and Justin didn't know what was going to come out either. Um, so so the, the computer was almost a collaborator in the artistic creative process. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really fascinating because um, some of the, you know we when you don't predict when you don't know exactly what all the characters are going to look like. Sometimes you come out with some that you're that are very pleasantly surprising, and you go. And sometimes you come out with some and you're like, um, like how, like, was this on purpose? It almost seems like they go together too well. And you think like it's, it, it's, well, when you come, when you generate thousands, you end up with some that are just like, people think like, there's no way a computer made this one. It's just too. <laughs> well, let's too, take a look at some well, of the wait, other wait, works. Yeah, let's look at it. But one more question for Nick. Uh, so Nick, you talk about uh, rarity. How did you, because you wanted some attributes to be r more rare than other attributes within the collection, is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, some things like um, laser eyes, which is this kind of significant in the cryptocurrency community of uh, being, being able to see, you know, focus on cryptocurrency mostly is related to Bitcoin. 
but like being able to hyper focus on cryptocurrency uh, becoming successful. So um, you did that by weighting certain characteristics over others so that some would be more rare, correct? Yeah. So in the, in the software. Okay. Let, let's uh, let's look at um, let's look at them, Chris. You want to see them, right? Yeah, let's see so them. And this, if they did so, sell, tell us. Uh, they all what sold, they went right? For. The entire collection to... sold out, correct, Nick? Right, right. It took it took six weeks. It, it started off really slow, um, but um, it kind of picked up momentum, and finally, and, and finally, then the rest of the thirty five hundred sold out in one one night. Okay, so. For those of us who just love money and not art, <laughs> let's find out. And I will try listeners to kind of describe what we're looking at. So let's go on to the next one. All slide. right. So these, yeah. So these are the top 10. These are the ones that sold for the most. And Nick, if you want to say anything about the attributes, like. About... Well, you should really, you should really put on like a grid and show a lot of them if you can. Cause. Well, I'll let well, the listener go. Because... Well, just put, let's go one at a time. The listener time, can so go we'll to OpenSea. The There'll be a link. The listener can go and look at them. But yeah, we're just, this is what, we're going to look at just the top 10. Okay, Nick? So sure. if you want to say anything. So this is the number 10. We've been looking at it for a bazillion years now. So here's, oops, <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. So here is uh, number nine best selling. Okay. So this is a green background. It's a guy with like Coke bottle glasses, a very strange looking kind of brayish cap. And uh, he's all. Also doing the uh, the double fingers surfer thing. Uh, for it's those like a shaka. If you're from Hawaii, uh, it's a shaka. tell us about this piece. Nick. He's got money in his pocket. Oh, thanks. Um, so so yeah. So one interesting thing about this is that that hat it can't go with any of the hair. So this was an exception. So other people have tried to do like some of these NFT collection. Uh, there's a lot of generated NFT collection artwork out there. And you'll see like there's a lot of flaws because some of their traits that go with other traits. So you can tr you can create like a tool that helps you ge generate your art. But if you, if your tool doesn't allow you to make exceptions, then you're gonna get end up with a lot of errors. And so you see how this hat is like cut sideways has a very has a diagonal deep yeah. cut line on it. So a lot of the other um, uh, the other other characters they can have a hat and they can have hair. But this one can't have a hat and hair, so because because the hair will always stick up over the hat. So this is an exception where um, if you get if if you get this hat and it gets laid down earlier in the um, actually the hair normally gets laid down earlier. Um, well, let me think. I can't remember now. It's been like so many months. <laughs> but like if you if you get this hat, the point is that you can't get the hair any of the hair. It'll skip the hair phase, um, and so like the tool that that I wrote to generate these collections. Um, to, to generate art like this is not like a public tool because I have to ch go and manipulate it each time in order to create a new collection. So, um, so the kind, so people have since created tools where they try and make this kind of thing. Um, but it's there's a very large user interface for some of the tools that people have created um, because it's just uh, it's just kind of a, a nightmare to kind of come up with the all, all these. Rules. Yeah, I just want to say, Chris, if you didn't know that, that, yeah, there's there's a huge marketplace for the tool Nick made from scratch. I mean, he made his own tool, uh, but wow. yeah, there's a huge marketplace for these tools now because people Wait. want to make these collections. Uh, awesome. Okay, let's uh, go on. To the... So, how much did this baby go for? Whoa, how much did it sell for? Uh, I don't know the artwork. I'll look it up. One thousand NFTs, so I don't know each one of them. I'll look it up. Let's go to the next uh, okay. one. Okay, fair enough. You don't know, you don't. Oh, okay. Uh, this looks like some crazy chef with a basketball on his fingers and binoculars on his orange shirt. Yeah, so uh, you can see uh, um, for those of you who are listening, the last two had the same. Describe this one, Nick. The last two had the same shirt. Uh, the last two had the same shirt because that's a rare shirt, so that's probably why you were seeing it. It's both of them having um, in uh, top selling. But this one is very different from the other ones. And you can see some of the variety. Um, you know, you've got the basketball and a completely different the body that has the binoculars and um, the chef hat. So um, this one actually has three different, like, really um, characteristic uh, traits that embody people's hobbies or professions that people might have. And that's something that um, we wanted to uh, address because because uh, people use these as profile pictures. So let me also. Um, we didn't really touch on that, but th another really important piece of this, of why this works, is because people use 
uh, NFTs as the profile pictures. So Justin was already doing characters. And um, if you wanted to do a, like a 4,000 um, collection of some random art, like pictures of uh, or, or, or some, some random art that you created that was a more abstract, um, your chances of selling it would be significantly reduced because that's not what people are using these NFTs for. Like people actually use them like for a practical purpose. They, they use these as their profile pictures on social media and on Discord or places like that. Right, because Twitter about, what is it, about six months ago or so, they allowed you to start using these as your, as your profile on, on Twitter. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so this one sold for about $375. Okay, here's the next Ow. one. Nice. Um, uh, yeah. It's a dude with a gold chain and a crazy eye and purple hair. And he's also doing the whole wine thing you were just talking about, Randall. Well, there was uh, a... Tell us about this piece. So, um, so there was also like a spike. So when, so when NFTs were higher around January, um, in like Jan January, February, like these were selling for triple what they are now, you know? So like, you know, that, well, what were they selling yeah, for at their height? Some of the, these were selling for over a thousand dollars at the time. And now the NFT market wow. has come down significantly. Um, but I expect it to go back up, but this right at this point in time, this part, this point in time of year, um, everything is down significantly. So all of these are basically super discounted at the moment um like so for the sake of time i guess let's just go quickly through the remainders and if there's something you want to point out make about any particular piece just stop and we'll point it out so we're just going to look at one last painting uh Ray, you want to show us the last painting hey, of i Justin think i believe this, this is the collection? one that's yes i believe this is the one that sold wow. for the most uh this is flame uh, is coming out of his eyes yikes this is the highest last sale on open sea let's see it was uh this one sold for three thousand one hundred twenty three dollars about wow that's more than wow I, I didn't even know it was that much can you uh, talk so, about this so one he... yeah briefly nick so um this one has fire eyes which is sort of just an invention of justin's um you know i told him about laser eyes and he was like how about fire eyes and i was like you know, okay why not <laughs> You know, uh, so Fire Eyes is kind of like a special Justin thing. And, um, you know, that like, for instance, I told you sometimes things just go together. Like this green body and this green hat are completely separate things, but they just happen to match in this case. So this, you know, person and the fist, the fist is personally like my favorite arm. Um, so this one just, it, you know, the, it has a matching shirt, has a fist arm. And his fire eyes. I think it just came out really, really nicely, and everything sort of oh, quite as far as sort of aligned. And you know, people really like it. And if you look at the stats, so OpenSea shows you what the rarity levels of all these traits are. And if you look at the stats, you actually, if you're like more of like a, like a, a quantitative trader, you can look at the stats and see which things are more rare than other traits and which ones are earlier usually nfts that have earlier numbers are worth more and nfts that have more traits that are rare are worth more so if you were to do some sort of like math and figure out like what you know, is, you know the rarest and what is the earliest number and all that you can find out what should be the most um sought after but then you have like other factors involved like you know like yeah i'm here. i'm looking at it on open c right now and it's like yeah this one has like all its traits are rare just about yeah so that's probably a, a huge factor okay let's okay well let's turn this off for now yeah and uh first off i'm gonna ask you two very contradictory questions uh first i just the money hat is in my mind so roughly speaking how much money did this collection generate um it was about six hundred and ninety thousand dollars that is a lot of money. It's nothing to sneeze uh, at. <laughs> um, that is yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. And, and... and aesthetically, this is really beautiful work. I want people to understand that it didn't make a lot of money just because it makes a lot of money. This is, there's, I think, a giant misconception that anything makes a lot of money, but you do need an artist with vision. And, and you guys were, I would argue, part of the creative process along with the computer. So what they're paying for is still an aesthetic experience, correct? 
Oh yeah, I mean it. it this the re the main reason you know I'm in the chat room with the people who are owners of this work every day, and the the driving force behind people buying into this collection is the art. Um, and in other collections, you know, they have all these gimmicks like, um, you know, if you buy this, then you get like a certain percentage of like something or, or you're going to get like you can nest them and you can stake them and you can do all these like sort of uh, uh, financial tricks to, uh, with this project. And none of those things last. Um, none of those those gimmicks last. And and the reason people buy this one isn't because there's some kind of uh staking and you get some extra coins or something the main reason is because people like the art and they want to support this art and they 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 feel a personal attachment to it hey nick uh which collection do you think was the first where they used algorithmically generated characters was it uh, bored ape or was it crypto punks um i don't know exactly how they did crypto punks but algorithmically generating characters has been around since crypto kitties uh, so, you, you know, if you want to get a lot of characters, there's only one way to do it, really, and that's to use algorithmically generated. Board, board it, definitely. I think the uh, CryptoPunks was algorithmically generated. I'm not sure, though, but I think it was. Hey, Nick, uh, hey. what is Justin up to now? Is he still doing this kind of art? Um, yeah, yeah, he still is. And so um, the thing is, like, this has been the best vehicle for for him to distribute his art that he's ever had. Um, you know, we, like, so just let me just say, like, out of that six hundred ninety thousand dollars that went for the sale, uh, most of them went to Justin. So, um, you know, it is supporting the artist, and um, then a lot of it went to like the marketing that we had to pay. And, I just um, want to be clear about something. So, in the art gallery world, usually the gallery takes fifty percent. <laughs> of all the sales so justin made way more than 50 percent on this one do you think nick yeah he did okay and uh just so we get back out of the money moment uh and you're kind of working towards this is there a dominant aesthetic you think in this art form um stuff that really communicates versus stuff that fails so it's a little bit it's a, it's a little bit diverse um there's some things i can tell you that don't do well um so what so does it do well Photography. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like, it, it, people just, people like uh, characters. They like 3D generated characters. They like cartoonish characters, um, you know, illustrations. Um, they like Japanese anime style, you know, manga style. Um, they like, um, they like sort of like almost anything that you would see like in a video game. Um, colorful. Um, but, what they they're not so interested in is like abstract art there's a there's a little bit of like uh demand for that there's a couple like famous collections that are sort of abstract but um all the top the real top collections are um characters like doodles and um you know there's just like sort of colorful yeah characters. you know chris uh you haven't looked through this kind of art very much i i'm, I'm assuming no. but uh but uh it's very pop arty it's like a lot of right. cartoons. That is characters. what it looks like to me. But it definitely, it, I feel like it, it's, I don't want it to be, I think that people do have misconceptions that it's just cheap art when there is real aestheticism to it. And uh, I'm assuming you work with other artists. Are there any other artists you just want to give a shout out whose work you're enjoying these days? Um, you mean other, like other NFT projects? Yes, other NFT artists, just if you wanted to. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think the doodles are, is really cool too. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of new ones that come out all the time and I'm like, I'm kind of busy, very like working on what we're, we're working on. Um, but, um, you know, I did buy, um, uh, I did buy like one of Gary V's new, um, NFTs, Gary V's uh, version two, I, 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 uh, Gary V, Gary Vanderchuk, is a big NFT influencer in the, in the world now, and he. Oh, I know um, he is actually. Yeah, yeah. He he created uh, V Friends, which was um, basically a lot of sort of doodles almost that he created that he was sort of made on the backs of napkins and things like that, and then he turned that into NFTs, and it was really popular. Um, but you know, the art was not like re very refined. Um, you know, some people really liked it. 
Um, but as far as like using it for what people are using NFTs for now, it didn't really fit the, 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 the typical um, situation. So um, he made a new version called Be Friends 2, and he hired some uh, artists, I don't know who they are, but they, they turned them into like um, much more refined um, uh, uh, characters. And so I, you know, I thought that the new ones were really incredible and people are buying them more for the arts and not so much just the, the original vert, the original collection, I think people are buying more so they could be close to Gary Vee. Um, I mean, sure, there are some people really like the squiggly, you know, caterpillar drawn on the back of a napkin with pencil, but uh, most people were buying it because Gary Vee was offering them, uh, anybody who bought those NFTs, the ability to like speak to him in person and join his conferences and stuff and get advice from him and, you know, and network. So. Now yeah, you you really are. I mean, we we just did a whole long episode on impressionism, and you know one of the things people very rarely ever talk about is a man named Theo Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh's brother. Vincent Van Gogh was the agent for Monet, Manet, some of the great impressionists and post impressionists, as well as his brother Van Gogh. And we know about Van Gogh through his brother. Uh, and you are really like the modern day uh, art agent or at least gallery owner, you really are uh, an in-between, a go-between that uh, brings the artist's work to market. And that's a very, that's a, a role that comes with tremendous responsibility and a lot of insight. So first off, I really want to applaud you on that, but also because you are an expert, I would like to ask you two different questions. The first is for somebody who is an artist who is trying to break into this medium of NFT art, what advice what what knowledge can you share with that person sure yeah so you know there there are um there are if you are an artist and you only do like one a couple pieces and um and, and you are, are like a photographer maybe like there's hope all hope is not lost uh you can hook up with a company like foundation um who uh focuses more on a uh, couple hands full of of single piece artwork and establishing yourself as a name um, uh, in the NFT art world and just releasing like a couple NFTs at a time. Um, it's better if those NFTs that you release are specifically made for, for the digital NFT space. So it's that is not just taking a photo of a painting that you did and then turning it into an NFT, but sitting down on the computer and creating something new that nobody's seen before and it only is released as an NFT. That is much more special to the nft people in the nft world um because if you take a photo of a painting now you just made a copy of some other piece of art and the other piece of art is really uh, potentially competes with the nft in a way um so so it's it's better usually to create specific art for nft and the most successful nft artists are ones who have almost invented a new medium like they like, like well not invented met the nft medium where it lives and started creating art specifically for nfts that's like animated usually um a lot of it is like 3d rendered um a, a lot of it is just something that you would never think to hang on a wall because it's just for one thing it's animated you can't hang an animated thing on the wall so um so if you're an artist um like look at what's out there in nft space you know get get familiar with digital tools um, and figure out how to make like a digital piece would probably be my best recommendation. And then if you are someone who thinks you could work with a company like mine um, to create um, like one of these large collections, it's really a completely different ball game in that um, you are not just creating artwork, but you're creating like a long lived community. You need to create like a discord for that community. Um, you need to create tools for that, that community to interact with each other. Um, and then you have to create sort of these uh, ways to for people to buy your art to launch the collection, um, and that's kind of like what a company like mine does is like you work with a, a, a development team like my team to. Oh, would they get in touch with you? Just so they did want to get in touch with you. Well, if somebody wants to get in contact with us, it's ownerfi.com, um, and then there's a contact button um, at the top of ownerfi.com, um, and. Um, oh. Yeah, and so we'll try to give a link to that, Randall, if we can. Of course. Uh, so Nick, so for Jay Pierce collection, you uh, you started a Discord for for the collection. 
Yeah, Justin has a Discord. Um, what is it, Discord? I'm sorry, I'm 56. Discord is a chat. Uh, Discord is a chat. Um, it's the, it originally was designed for people to get communicate through video games, but now it's taken on a life of its own. It's just chat for everything. It's mostly where the NFT community lives, as far as like where they chat. Um, and then each uh, they have these communities are called servers, which is a misnomer. I I hate that they're called servers because <laughs> um, they're not actually servers; they're just spaces. Um, so but, Jay, Jay Pierce had a Discord pre-existing. They used that to promote the collection. No, we made that. I mean, he had like for we, him. For him, yeah. Okay. And so now he has a Discord uh, server that he can use forever. Right, right, and it will last forever. That's the thing you have to realize. Like when you get in this, if you're not willing to commit, like the rest of your life to this community. What are, what other things did you do to promote? You had the Discord server, what else? For James? Um, yeah, so we have the Discord and there's Twitter. You probably wanna have like a Twitter. You can have your own Twitter account, but it's it's usual standard best practice to make your own, a new uh, uh, And you, he used the, you had a J Pierce Twitter account to just, uh, what kind of things did you post? So updates about the collection, you know, updates about the collection, uh, basically. Anything else that you use to promote? Well, yeah, I mean, you can use Instagram, but most people are on Discord and Twitter, and we have our own email group too, so that gives us a little bit of an edge as far as like... You mean OwnerFi? OwnerFi. Right. All right, so and, then the other question I wanted to ask was, what advice do you have to the collector? Especially because the market's not so good right now, so I want to get in, but the market doesn't seem to be good. Uh, how do I get in? How do I get well, involved? Yeah, so that's the thing is we, I am not, I don't want to be in the business of selling people something that they're going to be angry about. So, um, you know, that's why I'm very particular in the projects that we work with and, um, and, and what, and how, it, like, we laid them out and strategize them. So with Justin's, you know, we're doing a new collection and what we're doing with the new collection is we're giving away all of, so one thing, Justin really wants to make a new collection because he's just over the moon about how amazing this is that that people are buying his art that the art is in the hands of so many people a lot of the people who bought these nfts they're also ordering nfts they're also ordering physical art from him he's selling paintings to them now you know he's selling shirts and and custom shoes and stuff you know his, his art has been introduced to a lot of these people and he's getting a lot of physical art um new collectors and so he's just like this is this is phenomenal for him you know so um uh, and his career. So, so, so people are like, well, why do you want to make a new collection? Well, it's because Justin, he's like energized by this. Like he is like so energized that he can now like, instead of just making like, um, you know, one, one or two things in the morning and, and hoping that like, you know, like, uh, somebody will buy some, one of these things a month from now, or just the, the speed at which he can make things and distribute them is just, is exponential and so he wants to do this he wants to make he has so much more to offer so many ideas he's never been able to do because he didn't know if anyone would buy them now he can he can express himself so much better so we're doing a new collection and the new collection is going to give one of the every single person who bought one of the first and jpf nfts is going to be able to mint one of these for free so that wow. all the previous owners are going to just get one automatically so that like if you bought one you're not going to feel like Oh, you know, these guys, they're just making, they're just expanding this collection, just making more stuff, devaluing our art. It's like, no, you're in on this. Um, so that we want to keep giving value. You know, everything we're doing, we're strategizing so that we continue to give value to the people who bought um, these NFTs, hopefully like in depth. So NFT art is not just like a trend. It's, it's a real deal. Even though sometimes uh, I've been hearing how Bitcoin is suffering right now and all of that, it's, it's which you'd say it's more of a cyclical thing as opposed to a correction yeah so things are down now because uh this time of year things are always down you know uh, bitcoin runs in these four year cycles where every four years the mining rewards for bitcoins um uh, gets cut in half and then the price of bitcoin skyrockets um and then so you, you know you get these in between troughs in between and um and so it's very predictable and this it's, is it's part of the technical nature of Bitcoin, correct? It is built in the code. Um, so these cycles that we're going through are coded. Uh, I guess so, it just makes yeah. sense to buy the art you like more than the art you think will be valuable. It's, 
Yeah, it's both. Um, but like, and it, surprisingly, this part of the cycle that we're going through, like this middle of the year is always down, but it's even less down than it usually is. So it's a good sign. And what are galleries and art museums getting wrong about NFT art? What are they getting um, right? Yeah, yes. You know, like basically everybody's trying to do NFTs right now for arts. Um, you know, the Vatican is doing like an NFT um, art display. And, um, you know, they're get, the, the thing is like, it's, you know, you have to consider like what NFTs are, how many people are going to release, where they're coming from. So, you know, like just because somebody like so there was a company that was doing tweets, you know, doing basically screenshots of Twitter posts. And then people were, you know, Jack Dorsey sold, you know, his, his a Twitter post of his, and, but it was just a screenshot. And it's like, um, it's like, what are you selling? You know, are you going to make more? Like, what is it? There's so many factors involved. Like if you're an artist and you make NFTs, um, for uh for in on rareable on one website and then you go and make some nfts on OpenSea, where you're using two different wallet addresses you're you, now your nfts have been diluted in value because they people don't know who's making the original authentic nfts um one of the things is with when you do a collection like a ten thousand piece collection everybody knows a hundred percent they're all part of the same collection you know when the way that cryptocurrency works and crypto keys if an artist is just like releasing art through Maker's Place and then they're re releasing art through uh, So Rare, um, they're, they, people, people are confused. You know, who's the real artist? Who's making, you know, so being all, all putting all of these, like one of these like collections all on the same smart contract, all coming from the same address guarantees that they're all connected in some way. And so a lot of these like galleries and things they're just sort of willy nilly making NFTs that are coming from all sorts of random addresses. Maybe they're coming from the gallery's address. Nobody know, like they have no connection. They're, they have no like cohesion, and that's a really big problem. And they're, sometimes they're on all sorts of different blockchains, and people are like, "Well, like, is this the real artist? Is that like in a hundred years from now?" And they look back at all these NFTs. Are they going to know? Who made them? I mean, yeah. you know. they're making these NFTs with no understanding of the underlying technology, which is important, right, for collectors. Yeah, it's really, really, really important, actually. And it's one of the reasons why NFTs have value at all. Well, uh, so you use the Jay Pierce collection to uh, both promote him and establish him as an artist. And now you're using it to keep in touch with his uh, his uh, patrons. Yeah. So um, now you can sort of provably identify who owns one of these, you know, one of the actual real verified NFTs from Justin Pierce, so you can create these communities um, like they did with Board Ape Yacht Club and like Gary Vee did, where uh, you give like certain benefits, you create uh, like this networking opportunity, um, and you can give benefits to this specific group of people um, over time, and they become like uh, patrons of Justin Pierce and their own group, uh, their own club. And, and um, Nick, you've already had, you've already been to a Jay Pierce collection party. Is that correct? Yeah, we had like an after party in Arizona where all the uh, the owners were invited, and we had like Cirque du Soleil performers, <laughs> and like it, it, it was. Um, How did it turn out? Did a lot of people show? Um, yeah, people people flew in from around the world to come to this party, and. Um, you know, like uh, Justin, Justin paid for it, you know, like um, to, to, to give back. Um, and, you know, right now, like on the collection, we're giving all the royalties away to people um, in the not like the evenly distributed, but like just as sort of a like a prize. Like I think we're going to start voting on like the royalties for the collection go to whoever needs them most. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're trying to like continually give back to the community. Um, and treat the community like a community because we can identify the NFT allows us to exactly verifiably identify who the owners are. Which is Nicholas, I'd like to pivot away from the visual arts for just a bit because uh, before we did the show, you did point out we're kind of overlooking just the entertainment aspects of NFT. So could you, okay, we've definitely been fairly thorough about NFT in the visual art, but you have a lot to say about NFT in entertainment. So 
preach. Yeah, so um, what's happening is that NFTs, the technology, is more like a, is more shifting more towards this utility purpose of the NFTs. I think there will always be a space and room in the world for NFT art bodies, people who collect NFTs and who basically are patrons of an artist uh, or of a collection of artists. Um, which might be another strategy that artists can use is they can become, um, they can group together as, uh, and come together as a collection um, to help each other. But, um, but, but what NFTs do is they provide a utility that's never been possible before, and that is identifying a group of people who have all purchased something, who have all purchased tokens. And what that lets you do is uh, create um, patrons of anything so that might be um, patrons of, of a movie, um, of a song, of a musical artist, um, or um, membership in like a boat club or something. But like um, in, in relation to the entertainment world, uh, now you can create um, fan groups for, for any kind of media that you can imagine. And we've always had fan groups, but these fa- and we've always had people who collect memorabilia to become part of a group and then they end up going creating like conferences and star wars conferences and and these nfts allow people to more tightly connect to each other based on um a you know membership in a club so are you saying like movies tv shows uh filmmakers there's other outlets other kinds of art can take advantage of the nft yeah well if you want to make like an independent movie and right. um, and you want um, you want to people to support your movie. Uh, you know, you historically you might want to raise money for this movie uh, before it's been made by like going to a bunch of people, maybe going to a bank or something like that. Um, but now with NFTs, you might raise money for this movie by um, selling props for the movie ahead of time, and then people buy you know, like memorabilia from the movie before the movie is even finished being made. And now you can fund that movie um, or you can even sell not props. You can sell like say uh, collectible NFTs that are artwork about the movie before the movie is made. And then say that everybody who bought one of these NFTs gets to go to a special screening of this movie. Um, And then also it's a collectible um, NFT and maybe it has its own discord. And and Has something like that happened or you just, uh, no, it's already imagine. happened. Yeah, okay. no, it, that has already happened. Um, I can't think of the, the movies off the top of my head, but it's it's been happening. There's even people building platforms devoted to doing that specific purpose. Um, but the big movie studios, um, you know, like um, Disney and, um, and and some some of the other ones are are already making NFTs for their projects. You know, Batman has NFTs now. Um, Does uh, the music industry use NFTs? N- yeah, there's been you know dozens of artists who have released MP3s that give access to MP3s or to an album, um, and there's people building platforms around just doing that s- specific purpose as well. So it, the entertainment industry is going to be rife with N- NFTs. It's going to be there's going to be NFTs everywhere in the entertainment industry. Um, and right at first, it's going to all be scattered and, and disparate and, um, you know, people are using all sorts of random blockchains and all sorts of random tools and stuff, but it's going to consolidate more and more over time to the point where, um, you use the same, I believe at some point Apple will, uh, create, uh, will in, incorporate cryptocurrency into app, into their Apple wallets, you know, where you get your passports and store your credit cards now. You'll have your cryptocurrency and your NFTs will be in there as well, because there's no reason not to. I mean, it's just it's just a no brainer. So um, the tools will become more consolidated. And then, you know, your your Android device will have its cryptocurrency wallet that's built in like the moment you get your phone so that when you buy your NFT for, you know, for the movie that you like that's being made, they'll send it to your phone. And that's and they'll just be it just the, the railroads will all be in place and that will be more um standardized as we get those. So you, you think about it as something maybe someone will be giving as gifts to people, something that people will be creating as gifts to people. Yeah, yeah, right. So, um, you know, like, uh, 
as a gift, sure. Um, you know, you buy somebody like a ticket to something and then it, you know, to a show and then you send it to their wallet, you have it sent to their phone, you know, by their phone number or something, you know, it would just be that easy. Um, and then, or through their email, you say like you buy a ticket and you're like, oh, send this ticket. And maybe it won't even be called NFTs because uh, maybe people will, will stop using the word NFT because it's just right now, it's just the word for the technology, but it's convenient for people. Maybe they'll just start using digital, you know, send the digital asset to digital records send the send the digital version. Who knows? Maybe people will come up with a new word. Um, so about thought. five years from now, something like NFT will be as standard as how we talk about MP3s or JPEGs, or it'll just enter the language of our yeah. understanding of modern media. It's a placeholder for me for for basically how you spent your money on something, um, or who owns something. It's a placeholder for a property record, um, or it's like a key. Like another, I did the video on TikTok. And it's only because I've been using TikTok a lot <laughs> recently. Um, but I did a video where I compared NP, uh, uh, NFTs to keys. Um, an NFT is like a key, and right now it's you know people are buying the early stages of NFTs, people are just buying the keys, but they don't open anything. They're just buying them because it's an interesting new technology, the key, it's like the key was just invented. But, you know, people aren't gonna just keep buying keys for the sake of being keys. The keys are gonna actually have to open something. Um, so ultimately as time goes on, people are gonna make these, gonna have these keys open more and more things. And um, people, the, the novelty of just making a key and selling a key because there's a pretty picture on the key um, is going to wear off and it's going to be more and more about like, what does that key open? Well, why am I, what, why do I have this key? Uh, and that's what the NFT is. It's really, it's really more like a key than anything else. That's fascinating. Riley, you have any more questions? No, that is interesting, Nick. Um, what, uh, do you have any other, uh, predictions for the future of NFTs? Um, I mean, you know, I think I kind of mentioned it's just, uh, it's, I think they're going to infuse our everything in our daily lives. Um, the, the way the same thing we have like uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is infusing, starting to creep into people's uh, daily lives, and it's supported on like Cash App and um, these major platforms are supporting cryptocurrency. Um, Stripe, the huge payment provider, is starting to support USDC, which is a stable coin, it's a, like a dollar equivalent cryptocurrency. Um, those will infuse our daily lives and then NFTs will start to sort of infuse into our daily lives. And when you buy, uh, when you buy something like a, a television set at Best Buy, um, you get a, a digital receipt, which will say it's your digital receipt, but it will actually be like an NFT behind the scenes. It'll be in the format of an NFT. Um, so NFTs, I think will just, just be everywhere and will change the world in that like it'll create this like railroad track of ownership that allows people to um, build tools like um, stock markets that trade physical things, um, uh, digital, you, you know, you, you go to the stock market online that's trading like physical property uh, or like ownership rights of, of, of songs and stuff like that. Um, but it'll all be an M NFT format under the hood, but you'll be able to go there and, um, you know, buy a, a mountain bike or something and trade the mountain bike but the mountain bike is in a different place it's in somebody else's garage but you own it um because the ownership rights are an nft um and then people will be trading like futures markets on these things and stuff like that and it'll all happen through these digital marketplaces and then the format under the hood will all be nfts and it's that's what makes this kind of thing possible so it's going to change the world in, in a huge way well, that is fascinating, Nick. I want to thank you uh, for being on the show. Uh, always enlightening. Always we learn something new. Uh, Randall, I want to thank you for having a, such a good brother who's also an expert in this field. Uh, you guys have anything? Uh, Randall, you got any last words before uh, no. we? All no, right. I well, I want to say goodbye. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, can uh, I plug? Can I plug something? <laughs> yep, you can. I'm literally about to lose power on my go computer. Ahead. So, okay, go ahead. Okay. So if anybody wants to do any of that, like at ownerfy.com, we made an API, an NFT API that allows your software to do all of that through Ownerfy. Our, our NFT API is agnostic to whatever you want to use it for. Um, so you can just go there and if you have you know, an app or a 
website or whatever it is, and you want to make NFTs for your idea, you can just do it through OwnerFi's like backend API. And again, if you're just listening to us, do you want to spell OwnerFi for us? Oh yeah, it's owner and then fy.com. Owner.com. All right, that's where you guys go. Uh, Nick knows a lot. Nick is, you have done financially and cre- aesthetically so well in the year that we have spoken to you. I don't <laughs> imagine where you're headed next. Uh, Randall, it's so nice that you have a successful brother. Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's always good to have family members who can buy you dinner. So uh, <laughs> that said. I wouldn't go that far. All right. <laughs> so, financially, I can buy coffee. Randall's got a birthday coming up. I'm just <laughs> trying to remind you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. This I know you were very patient. We covered a lot of technical things, but I think even the most a uh, layman like myself could follow. Now I know how to say blockchain, NFT, all these cool words that I never knew before. So again, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Randall. That's Nick. We'll talk right, again bye. soon. Bye. Bye.